Welcome back. This is our third and last lecture of chapter one, stress management, the skill that affects all others. You recall that in the last lecture, we looked at the fifth and sixth of eight topics covered in this, in this first chapter. Today, we're going to focus on the next two topics, develop your own personal two-step stress management system and build awareness of your stress management abilities. Now, in the last lecture, I distinguished external and internal, internal stress, highlighting specific stressors from both categories. We also detailed chronic stress and its physical, mental, emotional, and behavioral effects. In addition, we talked about the distinguishing characteristics of both good and bad stress. And now we're going to look at just how you might develop a two-step stress management system. And it's really quite simple. The first step in this system involves becoming aware of your individual good and bad stress zones. I would highly encourage you to take advantage of the opportunity to write about this. And it's found, um, or it can be done by looking to exercises 1-3 and 1-4. There's a definite benefit to going simply going beyond simply thinking about this awareness. Um, something almost magical about writing what we think, particularly when we hope for clarification that eventually leads to productivity. As a personal example, when I'm in my good stress zone, when I'm feeling uh, on all cycles, as it were, um, there are certain things that I recognize that I feel, uh, those things include energy, energy, or I feel energized. I feel fulfilled. I feel productive. I feel alert. I feel clear minded. On the other hand, when I'm in my bad stress zone, I begin to feel tired. I sometimes, um, have a, a racing heart. Um, I find it difficult to sleep or insomnia. I tend to get impatient. And while in the bad zone, I tend to make poor decisions. So by thinking about and then writing these things down, I've developed a more clear contrasting picture of my good and bad stress zones. So next, quickly reorder the right side or your bad zone reactions so that they're in time order or chronological order. For me, I first start to make poor decisions. I start to feel fatigued. Um, this is followed by impatience. My heart sometimes starts to race and then I find it difficult to sleep at night. So there's the chronicle, um, the chronological order of the bad zone for me, for my personal um, experience. Now, it doesn't have to be chronological. It could be another way to order the bad zone reactions is by frequency or it could be by severity. In any case, by writing these things down, you're reminded of the personal consequences of being in the bad stress zone. The more you continue to develop your stress chart over time, the more profitable it becomes. And the way that you continue to develop it is by adding to the good zone and adding, adding to the list of things that happen in the good zone and those in the bad zone. And if you actually use this information that you've taken this time to write down on your chart, you're going to come to re recognize more often when you're beginning to enter that bad stress zone. So you can quickly intervene to prevent further bad things from happening. So when I recognize that I'm finding it difficult to make an otherwise simple decision, I make changes or take specific actions that at least reduce the bad zone consequences. And Sometimes my productive actions can take, take me out of the bad stress zone altogether. But either way, I'm better off as a result of my recognition of the bad zone signs. Here are some helpful hints to consider as you um, develop your stress chart over time. I'll just leave you guys to read these.
Step two involves action. We experience the reaction to a stressor and then we act upon it. Now, the truth is that we sometimes react in unhealthy ways and don't get me wrong, a lot of times those reactions actually work. For example, let's say Gordon works two jobs. For the, the, the first full-time job, uh, it, the first full-time job is a regular eight-hour job, and the second one's a part-time where he works three to four hours a night. He gets off his first job at 3 p.m. and starts his job, his uh, second job, at 5. He has about two hours of free time between jobs, but over time, Gordon recognizes that just before entering the workplace in the afternoon for his second job, he develops a slight tick in his eye and a nagging headache takes over. He knows that the stress of two jobs is probably too much. So one day he's, he's dropped himself in his easy chair to take a, a break between jobs and he happens to glance over at the refrigerator. A beer, he thinks. And when he goes to work that afternoon, magically things seem a lot better. Things are smoother. He's not as stressed. This becomes a habit for a couple of weeks, but one day he realizes that the headaches are creeping back in. One beer becomes two. By the end of six months, he's consuming four to six beers between jobs in order to deal with the bad stress. Well, it seems to do the trick. His weight has increased significantly. He's finding it harder to sleep at night. His day job takes a hit as a result. You can see where this will probably lead. So what are the healthy options for dealing with the bad stress zone? There are many, and they depend on your particular situation. Let's take a look at five that are found in your textbook. Physical exercise relieves stress. And the kind of exercise done isn't nearly as important as the fact that it is done, whether it's a brisk walk, a jog, bicycling, lifting weights. The kind of exercise isn't that important. We'd all be wise just to take heart to that simple yet great Nike slogan, which is what? Just do it. One important fact to remember is that aerobic exercise, that is exercise that increases your breathing and your heart rate, has been definitely proven to release what we call endorphins. This means that <clears throat> when you aerobically exercise, pain is diminished and mood is elevated because we can't always drop everything while we work or while we're in class. It's good to have a variety of options available for any particular situation. Examples could include a short walk on a break, maybe just stretching, maybe you have a set of steps you can walk up and down a few times. Again, it's all about, it's about making it happen. Allow me, if you will, to explain the way I begin my day. I roll out of bed about seven. And by about a couple minutes past seven, I'm in the kitchen making some coffee. Take my coffee to my office. I sit down and have some personal devotion time. And then I spend about 45 minutes minutes to an hour in exercise, then I read the news, and it's time for breakfast. Now, I've been retired for about two years, and this is why I can take this amount of time to do these things every morning, but exercise has always been a part of my life. I'm really grateful that I had amazing mentors throughout the decades who educated and encouraged me in this regard. I really hope that you'll take the time to set up a simple exercise schedule for yourself. It's bound to produce nothing but good things, not the least of which is, is a, a decrease in stress and anxiety. I know it works for me. I know for a fact that if I didn't do my exercises every day, even the bad days would be worse. The good days wouldn't be as good. On that note, let's take a look at a great to the point video on the benefits of exercise with an emphasis on its effects on anxiety and stress. Exercise is a natural antidepressant 
and is proven to be very helpful in dealing with any sort of anxiety issues. In this video, we are going to clarify how physical activity has such a great impact on your mental well-being and what sort of exercise you should be doing to get the maximum positive effect for coping with your anxiety. Also, how should you start? What is the best way to motivate you to get started even though you might have developed anxiety around exercise itself? Everyone knows that it is a fact that people who are physically active live longer and are less prone to illnesses. Heart attack, strokes, inflammatory disease are all less common in people that are active than their lazier counterparts. So, just for the physical health benefits alone, it should be worth doing regular exercise. Regular exercise has a great positive impact on your mental well-being, which is shown by plenty of studies that clearly present that being active makes you happy and content. How does physical activity help with anxiety? First, exercising causes your body to send out neurotransmitters such as serotonin, dopamine, and adrenaline, which all contribute to your well-being and happiness. Second, Endurance sports are proven to lower the activity in the prefrontal cortex, the part where emotional stimuli are transformed into actual conscious feelings. Number three, the very periodical nature of many sports such as jogging, cycling, and swimming are known to have a very calming effect. As an anxious person, your muscle tighten, which can cause a lot of physical symptoms such as chest tightness, tingling, or headaches. Being physically active releases this tension in your muscle plus makes them stronger so you will be less inclined for tension in the future. Now, let's move on to what kind of sports you should be doing. First of all, any kind of exercise is beneficial to your health but cardio workouts such as swimming, jogging and cycling seem to be the most effective to quiet your mind especially if you get to do them outdoors in the fresh air and under the sun. However, ultimately, your choice should be made on what you enjoy most. If you have fun with what you're doing, it is so much easier to make exercise a habit and introduce it into your life routine. And what should you do if you're the type that can't be asked to get up and work out? Well, you now know the benefits it can have on your mental health, so why don't you give it a go for just a few weeks? I can promise that after just a few weeks, you will feel the great impact it has on your well-being and life altogether. But to get there, you have some initial willpower. And these simple tips can help you at the beginning. First, find an activity that you don't hate and hopefully enjoy. Don't do it just for the health benefits. Once you have found something you can imagine doing, start slowly and gradually. Don't go ahead and start running 10 kilometers every day. You will be burned out and demotivated in no time. Then always plan and have a schedule. Ideally, you should dedicate at least 30 minutes on three days of the week for your workout. But the most important part is the first few weeks. At the beginning, you will need real power to get up and get moving. But after a while, it will be part of your routine. You will crave for the next time you get to work out, especially after you see some of the physical change that come along with it, such as losing weight, a more toned body, or just simple better physical condition. Hope you enjoyed the video and if you want to watch more anxiety and self-improvement content just like this one, please subscribe to the channel and a like, it's always appreciated. Thank you. Getting enough sleep and eating healthy foods increases the probability that you'll remain in your good stress zone. <clears throat> when we're lacking sleep and good nutrition, our ability to handle even the average stressors throughout our day is much more difficult. It's been well established that not everyone needs the same amount of sleep. Some people need nine or 10 hours while there are a minority of lucky individuals who function effectively with as few as four or five. I'm certainly not one of those. And on that note, the amount of sleep necessary to function at 100% is dependent upon more than just an average per individual. Sometimes six hours is enough. Sometimes eight or nine is necessary, but much of what we need is dependent upon energy depletion due to both physical and mental stressors throughout our day. 
How we determine how much sleep we need on a particular night is due in large part to how we feel after we've completed our day, including our last meal. One way to improve the possibility that you sleep well is to follow the recommended eating window, which is less than or equal to 8 to 12 hours a day during daylight hours. So what does that mean? That means that let's say that you wake up at 7.30 and you're eating breakfast at 8. Your first meal begins at 8 that day. Ideally, you should have your last meal, according to what the research has shown, no later than 4 p.m. That's eight hours later. That's not too realistic, is it, though? So I say this. If you have your first meal at 8, just make sure that your last meal is no later than 8 p.m. And this, this leads us to the nutrition topic. I won't lecture you with all the details of uh, what you should eat or what we should all be eating. Everyone pretty much, pretty much knows in general what that is. Suffice it to say that there are three important things to keep in mind, and these are crucial. The first one is drink plenty of water. Scientists say, biologists specifically, that we should be drinking six to eight glasses every day. Limit caffeine intake. Caffeine's a great energizer, and I love coffee. But it can too much can make us anxious and nervous, and that's what we're trying to avoid. And lastly, limit sugar sugar intake. Not in your this is this one's not in your textbook, but for all of its benefits, all the benefits of reducing sugar intake, staying away from sugar isn't easy. I mean, I have a sweet tooth, so I totally understand. This is a struggle. You know it's the right thing to do, but man, those sweets, those cookies, that ice cream, they call us, don't they? Three reasons to reduce sugar intake are these. First of all, sugar reduces sleep quality. Next, it stimulates appetite and cravings, which is never good. And then it increases inflammation. And over the past five to six years, the the scientific research and studies have shown that inflammation is one of the worst things for the human body, and it causes more illnesses than anything else. So be careful with the, the sugar intake. Time off is sometimes needed in order to recharge our batteries, as it were. A lot of times when we feel overly stressed, we're being called to slow down, take a break. And there are healthy ways to do that, including maybe getting lost in a song or working on a painting. Maybe a walk around the block does the trick for you or you're someone who finds relaxation in watching a short video. The point is to find what helps you to refocus and relax, even if it's only for a few minutes. So often when a problem arises, we'll focus on the problem. And the more we think about it, the more stressed we become. It's hard to come up with ideas and use good decision-making skills in that frame of mind. And a short break can be just the ticket. Sometimes when we step away and focus for a bit on something altogether different than the problem we have, the return to the problem then becomes something we can deal with more effectively. We have, as it were, a fresh brain and a new kind of creative problem-solving mode. It's been estimated, and I put this picture up here because I see it and laugh every time, but it's been estimated that children laugh a hundred times a day. Maybe there's a lot to be learned from children. How can you think adults laugh each day? Probably not a hundred on average. How often do you laugh? Humor also has psychological effects, such as helping to resolve problems and reduce stress and anxiety. You've probably been in a stressful situation with other people when a joke broke the ice. Humor therapy is even used to enhance some medical treatments. And we've all heard laughter is the best medicine. There are a lot of techniques you can use to add humor to your life. And one of the most effective tools is to simply smile and laugh out loud more often. Look for humor in every situation you can. Don't be afraid to laugh at yourself. 
At the same time, you need to always remember to take your study and work responsibilities seriously. The next time you're on hold or dealing with one of those frustrated automated telephone menus or in a traffic jam and beginning to tense up or stress out, put a big smile on your face. You'll find it's nearly impossible to feel bad when you're smiling. This will probably prevent something that is out of your control from ruining the rest of your day. Try it now. It's uh, exercise 1-6. You might find it to be effective. Social support, friends, family, loved ones, clubs, organizations, these can all help with stress relief. Be careful because interactions with people can also cause bad stress. But all you need to do is remain aware of your early stress signals. And if you notice any, do something positive to get you back into your good stress zone. Although social support can be really positive, it's always good to keep in touch with yourself. Try exercise 1-7, which helps you vent safely about whatever may be causing you stress. Thanks for taking the time to listen. Let's take a look at what we've discussed in this, the last lecture for chapter one, stress management, the skill that affects all others.